If you need a handout, raise your hand and John will get one to you. There will be a little bit of audience participation. The message is rather short as far as the length of it. It's just two pages of handout and only like 10 slides on the wall. But there will be some audience participation. So get ready to volunteer or be called on. Okay? So we looked at our announcements. And uh, then Floyd and Terry, this uh, coming up, starting tomorrow, next month, Floyd and Terry have an anniversary, and Dave and Twyla have, a, uh, have an anniversary, and then Terry's got a birthday, so think of those, and they'll do all that kind of stuff. All right, you'll notice on your handouts that the front cover says there is a lab here, and the inside cover doesn't, but that was a misprint, okay? It says the is, the, the RE is missing. You can write those in if you want, all right? It's your first notes you can take is there's an RE on there is. All right, and the back page of this is not John chapter six because the the account of the feeding of the of the people here with the, with the loaves and the fishes is also in Matthew. So I just put that on there so you can have the rest of that. But we're just looking at the two inside pages. All right, of the handout. So we start in John chapter six verse one. It's after these things. Now, if it starts with the chapter and the chapter starts after these things, what do you know? Something happened. There was something before, okay? So John chapter 5 ends with Jesus teaching in Jerusalem. It would be very good for you to go back and read chapter 5 and see what he's teaching about, not right now, but what brings on this topic that he's talking now about and this event that's going on, because it says that he's teaching after these things. He went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And so the Sea of Galilee and the Sea of Tiberias and the Lake of Gennesaret, the Bible calls it all three things, and they're all the same thing. We would call it the Sea of Galilee. So when you see the Sea of Tiberias or Lake Gennesaret, it is the Sea of Galilee. Well, why does it call it so many things? Cape Canaveral, Cape Kennedy, same place, okay? Uh, we call things by, you know, your name may be Fred, your wife calls you Honey, Guys at work call you something else, but it's all the same person, okay? Depends on where you're from and what dialect you're speaking and all that kind of stuff is, is what they call things. So depending on who's writing to whom, they call it certain things. We saw that in the book of Revelation last week when John says, now that old serpent, Satan, the devil, you got, we're all, we're all on the same page now. Whatever you talk about him, we're talking about that guy. So we see at different places in the scripture, it gives it three names. That's a little, little education for you, all right? So after these sayings, after Jesus is preaching in, in, in Jerusalem, he goes up to the Sea of Galilee. Now think, this is several days later, because it takes two or three, four days, depending on the pace of your walk, to get there. He was here, as it were, in Fort Myers. He was in Jerusalem. And now at the Sea of Galilee, he's up in Tampa. And he walked there, okay? So it's a couple days afterwards. But the next major event is about this. And a great multitude followed him. Well, where did they follow him from? From all over, but from Jerusalem. So there's other people that are walking with him, and he's picking up people on the way. And why did they follow him? There's a, see the question there? Why did the people follow Jesus? Now, who knows? Somebody volunteer, or I'll call on you. Miracles. Miracles. Look what he did. Let's see what he does next time. Now, were some of those people really faithful believer type people? Some probably. But, but do you think most of them would have been like most people even today? They would say, hey, it's a good show. There's another place in the Bible where, the, where it talks about, and they followed him because they gave them food. Now they're following him right now because of the miracles. Later on, it says they're following because he gave out free food. Now, Jesus wasn't that way, what I'm about to explain, but... Today in American, everywhere, but in American politics, who do you vote for? Who's going to give me? That's not why Jesus, Jesus was meeting needs. People were following for selfish reasons, but that's not why he was doing it. Okay? Because when they came following him because he gave food, he says, I'm not going to give you food now. That's not what I'm about. I gave food last time because you were hungry. Now you're just trying to get something. But he followed. They were following him, some for the right reason, but many for the wrong reason. Probably most of them for the wrong reason, because that's what the Bible refers to. They followed him because of the miracles, and well, we want him to heal me too. Now, is there anything wrong with wanting to be healed if you've got a problem? 
And what did the Bible say? He healed everybody that came. Okay, so let's not get down on them, but let's understand a lot of times our motivation, and listen to me, sometimes our motivation is self-centered. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Well, if I do that, God's got to bless me. No, he doesn't. If I regard iniquity in my heart, he will not answer me. Why are you following God the way you're following? Is it for the right reason? That's something that you need to look at and check out in your life. Verse 3, Jesus went up onto a mountaintop, and there he sat with his disciples. Now, it doesn't say it in the, in the actual English words here, but what is Jesus now doing? They've just walked three or four days to get there. There's a bunch of people. He looks at his fellows and says, come on, let's go over here. Why? Pardon? I, I, I want to, I'll be Jesus here. I want to talk to these guys a little bit. I want a break. I just walked three days and people are saying, heal me. Come on. Let's get you guys aside. I'm going to be doing. Now, did Jesus know what was going to go on? As, as God, he did. But as the God man, as the man, he's waiting to see how people respond and what people say. But as God, he knows what's going to happen. Fellas, let me help you here. Let me talk to you a little bit. But let's see what happens in this whole repose, as they say. As Jesus takes his disciples aside, the Passover, the Feast of the Jews, was nigh. Look at me. Why in the world, in the middle of this story, let's no surprise, there's going to be a feeding of 5,000 guys. That's the story, right? That's the account. But in the middle of it, he says, oh, by the way, the Passover's here. Why? Why would the Holy Spirit say, and in the fourth quarter, as he's about to throw the pass, by the way, there was a guy up here wearing a goofy hat. Why would he throw that in? Nothing is in there by mistake. All this is occurring when the feast of the Passover is close at hand. It's nigh. Stop and think. Where had Jesus just come from? Jerusalem. When the Passover takes place, where does he got to be? Jerusalem. So he walks three days away from the place he's got to be in a couple of days. Why? There's something that needs to be taught. Somebody needs to be said. Something, somebody needs to be reached. Folks, understand this. In the will of God for your life, it's not always the most practical as I see it. Oh, well, if I was doing it, I would have just stayed at Jerusalem. The Bible says elsewhere. And he passed through Samaria. He needs to pass through Samaria. He needed to do it. Now let me ask you a question. Do you know everything? Do you know almost everything? You know, the smarter you get, the dumber you know you are. Does God know everything? So if God tells you to go here, go there, go there, stay here, stop, what should you do when the guy who knows everything tells you to do something even you, though you don't think it should be that way? Now, get with me here. When I get upset about something, what's usually the reason for my being upset? I didn't get my way. Because all of us, myself included, all of us, most of the time have a very egocentric view of life. And I've used this illustration in the past, I'll use it again here today because it makes the point. Last night when people went to bed, they were not going to bed Saturday night thinking, now tomorrow morning is Sunday, how can I make Dave Vanneman's day better? When I drive down the road, I wonder how I can make his pathway to church easy. People don't think that when they go to bed. They're thinking about their next day, not mine, right? You can apply that any way you want. But I go to bed thinking, what have I got to do tomorrow? What am I going to have for dinner? I'm not thinking about what you're going to have. Now you can apply that across the board and everything. We have a very narrow-minded, how does this affect me? It's really very selfish. I don't mean that in a terrible, awful year, but I mean, really, we're very selfish in the way we think about things. And when God says, do this, well, that's not how I would do it. The fella who knows everything is talking to a person who's a 
dumb as a box of hair, why would I question what he tells me to do? Guys, Passover's in a couple days. We've got to be back here. But let's take a three-day walk north. We get up there. Everybody wants something to done. Come here, guys. Let me talk to you a little bit. But by the way, don't forget, Passover is nigh. We've got to get the context. So on your little chart there, I'm not going to go through all this, but I gave you two little charts on the Jewish calendar. So what time of year was this? Well, now we're going to talk about our calendar. If it was us, when is this in the, in the, in the, uh, the American year? When is this? March, April. Spring. For the Jews, it's the first of the year. They didn't celebrate New Year's Day on January. They celebrated, they celebrated it at Passover time, which is in the spring. So we're about to have a new year, and we start the new year on the 10th day of the first month by having the Passover. Okay? So there's a chart, and there's another chart that has more detail in it. You can use those for your own perusal. Okay? Verse 5. When Jesus lifted up his eyes, stop, think, I'm going to ask you a question, somebody answer. He lifts up his eyes and he sees people. Where is he? Verse 4. He's with whom? His disciples? Apart. He's up here. So when Jesus is talking to you, does he got his eyes on anybody else? Or are you the focus of his, att his attention and just you only? Or is he looking at everybody? Dealing with you, but dealing with them too. Seeing you, but seeing them too. Meeting your needs, but meeting theirs too. But this group, in the, in the account that we have here, this group that he sees, when is their need going to be met? A little bit later. The guys he's with, he's talking about, stay with me, fellas. Something's going to happen here. Okay? He looks and he sees this company of people coming to him, and he looks over at Philip. Now, now bear with me. It's, try to get this. I get to be Jesus in this illustration. You're the crowd, and you're coming, and here's the 12 guys. Well, fellas, there's some people coming. Hey, Philip, what time is it? It's time to eat. Well, go give them something to eat. But Lord, I get to be Philip now. Lord, we don't have enough money to buy the bread. We, don't, we couldn't buy enough. Where would we go to buy it? We don't have the money to buy it. They're not there yet. But Jesus is up here with his 12, says to Philip, give them bread. And what does Philip say? We're not, we don't have enough money. Okay. But the people are still coming. Verse 6, and this Jesus said to him, Philip, because Jesus already knew what he was going to do. When Jesus asks you to do something, does he already know how it's going to get done? Then why the thunder does he ask you? Because, you know, it's, it's just all predestined. It's going to happen anyway. Would you like to be part of what I'm about to do? You have the free choice of being a participant in this. Philip, give them to eat. Would God ever ask you to do something that you're going to fail at? There's nothing you can do but fail at it. No. God will never ask you to do something that you can't get done. Might you need help with it? Yeah. Yeah. Usually you do, because God asks to do a lot of things that I can't do that on my own. But faithful is he who called you, he will perform it. Well, I just yield. God looked for a man, and what did Isaiah say? Here I am. I'm a man of unclean lips, but here I am. Use me. Did Isaiah get used? Did God's will get done? Did Isaiah get to be part of it? But Isaiah could have said, I hope you find somebody. Hey, when was the last time you said, Lord, okay. Or do you look at the financial end of it and say, we don't have enough money to get that done. He paves 
his streets with gold. Can he take care of the finances that you think are impossible? You say, well, that's a great plot and little sound, but no, I'm telling you folks, it works. Stop wrapping your heart and mind and thoughts and your mindset around the financial structure. Should you be dutiful about the budget of your life? Yes. Should you be consumed with and worried over it? No. Philip? Philip was worried about something. Why? What? How does God work in your life to prove you? For Philip, Jesus said, feed them because God knew, Jesus knew, Philip's mind was on finances. Philip, can this be done? Money. How does God prove you? This he said to prove him. Now, who is it that the proving is being done for? Who? Philip. Did Jesus already know what he was going to do? So was he asking Philip so he, Jesus could prove the situation would work? No, he already knew what he was going to do. He asked Philip so Philip could get... Philip, it's not about money. I am God. You are my disciples. There's some hungry people. Feed them. Can you do whatever God asks you to do? Yeah. Now keep that in mind because they're going to get fed. And Philip's going to help feed them. But did Philip have any food? Did he have any money to buy food? But Philip ends up feeding people. How the thunder does that work out? All right. Verse 7. Philip answered, hey, 200 penny worth. You could not do this with 200 days worth of daily wage. It would take me two-thirds of the year to maybe get them each a crumb. That's how expensive this is going to be. It's not sufficient for them that every one of them could take even just a little bit. So what, what is Philip focused on? Yeah, what's Philip focused on? Money. This is financially impossible. Now listen, God has been very good to us here at Crossway. When I came here 14 years ago, did you have a debt? Was it compared to the church size? And was it a big debt? Do we have a debt today? How did that work? Does God take care of money problems? Now, I, bear with, I don't want to, I don't remember. But when I came here 14 years ago, what was our church debt? Like three, four hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand dollars, something like that. Look around. It, God blessed you. You gave, and the bill is gone. Amen. Hey, ain't none of us in here singularly or collectively that has that much money to come up with? In well, actually, it was twelve years. How did God do that? God says, "To be faithful to me, I'll take care of it." And he did. But whose actual money paid the bill? Well, mine, yours. And yet I've never missed a meal. Never got foreclosed on. Don't have holes in my shoes. Hey, will God take care of things? Philip, I'm trying to prove you to you. What are you trusting? Me or your wallet? Okay. One of the disciples, a guy by the name of Andrew, happened to be Simon Peter's brother. He walks up. Now, now get this. We're going to read between the lines here. Jesus is up here with the twelve. The people are coming. Philip, go. I know what I'm going to do, but Philip, I'm proving you. Somehow, Andrew walked out into the crowd. And he comes up and he says, hey, Jesus, 
there's a lad here. Who is it specifically that God is going to use to do what needs to be done for the thousands of people who were there to teach his disciples something? This kid. This kid, who let's read between the lines, okay? He gets up in the morning, he hears the talk about, his parents are talking about, and either on his own wants to, or his parents send him to find out what's going on, or why were the people following him? Because they wanted to see a miracle and get healed? Maybe he had a problem? I don't know. But when he gets there, he's got a sack lunch that his mom made for him. Okay. Philip doesn't think we can do it. There's not enough money. Andrew runs out and finds what food there is. It's a little, for sake of argument, little kid that limps or whatever. He's got a lunch. Hey, master, we found this kid. All right. But what are these five barley loaves? Barley loaves were the cheap bread, okay? Not the good fine meal bread, the barley loaves, hard biscuits, and two sardines. They weren't sardines, but they were small fish, okay? These two small fish, these shiners, these minnows, but what's this among so many people? Stop and look at the wall. Okay, Floyd, read that next line. The first blue one. This nameless lad is never mentioned outside of this event. As far as we know, in this boy's entire life, what was God's will for him? Okay. In order for this kid to be there, he had to have a reason to be there. Why were people following? To get healed. It seems then, probably he wanted to get healing. In this needful kid, in all of the Bible, he's mentioned in one event. Reminds me of the guy with a donkey. Hey, kid! I'm going to make you a cripple, deaf, blind in one eye. I don't, I don't know what it was. Because there's going to be a day when the Messiah comes through and you're going to want to see him. And your mom's going to make you a lunch. Now watch what I'm going to do. What's God's will for you? Well, I won't be the next, you know, Billy Graham. So what? I won't be the next big singer. So what? All we know about this kid was he came up on Tuesday with a couple of fish and some biscuits and a limp. But what was the result? Hey, guy doesn't know what he's supposed to do. The only time we ever hear about him is he comes to a place with a donkey and somebody comes. Jesus sends some guys over to get that guy's donkey. We don't know anything about the guy. We don't even know his name. Just like this kid. What's God's will? Well, you know, it's magnificent. And, you know, I'll be the next Moses. Really? No. Pay attention to what seems to be, seems incorrectly to be, insignificant, insignificant people who do insignificant things that turns out huge. And what was their part in it? As far as Andrew was concerned, he wasn't worried about money, but what was he focused on? What, 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 was, what was his problem? Rosemary, what was, what was Andrew's problem? Andrew, the guy in the green, the next one. Can't read it? Not enough, yeah, doesn't have, we don't have enough supplies. Money's not the problem, but Lord, we don't have enough stuff. You ever worried about, well, I don't need to buy anything, but I just don't have any stuff. God can't supply enough stuff. We're having this 4th of July picnic. Bring some extra food. Well, I don't have enough money to buy. Just bring a cookie. Bring an extra slice of bread. Well, I just don't know. I don't know if God can give me enough stuff. 
He said, hey, let's have a universe. Poof, it's there. But Andrew was worried about how much stuff God could provide. Look at me. Don't ever worry about how much God has to give you. He's got everything you need. Everything. Big buckets of wow. Woo! God just gave me this box. Then open it up. Wow! Everything I need is there. And more. Philip was worried about money. Don't have enough. Andrew was worried about stuff. Don't have enough. Both men are thinking, God can't supply this. But I did bring the kid up. He's got these biscuits and fish. What is your attitude personally about what God has supplied you with? Think. I'm giving you time to think. Well, I don't have much. Don't think of it that way. If you think I, God hasn't given me much, you're comparing yourself with somebody else who you think has more. And the person you think's got more is looking at you thinking, I wish I had what they had. Because we're all different. We all have what we need. So that when we get together, we have what we all need. But Thursday at the picnic, we all bring a box of char a bag of charcoal, but nobody brings any steak. What are we going to do? Eat charcoal? <laughs> so Fred, you know, he owns the, the ranch and he's got all these cows, he just butchered baby, and he, he brings in a whole side of beef and no charcoal. Somebody bring <clears throat> sign up, look. I'm bringing coleslaw and potato salad and some sausages and some cold cut sandwiches. Got to be something that somebody likes. Anybody want to bring something I like? I'll, I'm, I'm hunting for the food I don't like. I haven't found it yet. Okay? Will God take care of the supply? But both Philip and Andrew did not trust Jesus yet as God. Think about this for a second. After the resurrection... After the empty tomb, after the walking into the, the upper room and saying, here I am. After that, Peter is out fishing. And Jesus said, do you love me, Peter? Oh, yeah. Do you, really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. When you're converted, Peter, who saw the empty tomb, touched the risen Christ, walked on water, Christ said, now Peter, when this finally sinks in, be a leader, be a teacher to your brethren. And here these guys are up on the hill. You've been teaching us and everything is great. We've seen miracles. We've seen stuff. But I don't know if you can do that. We're still not really sure that you're really God. What does he have to do in your life before you're convinced? Make it personal. Think. In Sunday school, we're talking about, do you really love God? Oh, yeah, I, I, I'm a Christian. It's not what I asked. Do you really love God? Love him. Oh, I read my Bible. It's not what I asked. I tithe. That's not what I asked. Okay, here's the question. Wives, does your husband love you? How do you know? Well, because he gives me stuff all the time. Is giving things the end result that just, that, that's what love, love is, I get stuff. If your answer is yes, you've got a problem. And if you think that's the answer and you're thoroughly convinced your husband loves you, husbands, stop giving them so much. See if they still love you back. I'm being as serious as I can be here. Does love produce generosity? Is it great to get the gifts? But blessed is he who gives more than he who receives. 
It's more blessed to give. How many of you love God so much you're willing to give your life? Really? Well, you know, I could have been somewhere else, but I came to church. I'm not talking about you gave up an hour and a half of your time this week to come to church service. Well, I gave up, I put $10 in the offering plate. I don't know. God loved us so much, he gave his only begotten son while and when we hated him. How much do you love God? Just chew on that one for a while. So what's your attitude about the provisions God has given you? Verse 10. And Jesus said now to the fellows, they're all back, all 12, because Phil, uh, Andrew's back with the kid, tell them all to sit down. So they set them down. <clears throat> and they're in groups, of, and they're sitting there. And there's about 5,000 men. Now, a lot of people say, well, there was probably wives and little kids. Yeah, but we don't know. But there's at least 5,000 men plus whatever else. So if half of their wives came, they'll, okay, there's 7,500. And if they all brought a kid, there's 10,000 people. But we know there's five. That's not the point. The point isn't how many. The point is there's at least 5,000 men. Now, come on. Fourth of July picnic's coming up. Man, woman, boy, girl, little baby, who typically do you figure is going to eat the most? The man. Because how do you handle a hungry man? Oh, the man handler. You know? Come on, guys. You know, when you sit down at dinner today, who's going to eat the most food? Usually the guy. And Andrew and Philip will say, 5,000 guys here. We don't have enough money for that. We don't have enough stuff for that. So God says, write this down. There's, there's a bunch of people, and 5,000 of them are men. You all get the idea here. We got five loaves, two fish, and 5,000 guys to feed, plus whoever else. And when Jesus took the loaves, and he gave thanks, hey, whatever you think you got or don't have, but whatever it is you end up, well, this is a lot or a little, but I've got it. Are you thankful for it? If you got it, where did it come from? Every good and every perfect gift cometh from the Father above. Whatever you've got, it's what he gave you. Are you thankful? Now, this is to me remarkable. Jesus, who is God, who already knows what he's going to do, gets the bread and the fish from the kid, and he says, thanks, Dad. He doesn't just assume that because I am the God-man and I knew what I was going to do all along, why should I be thanking myself? As the God-man, he says to the disciples, always be thankful. Thanks, Dad. Then he starts to break them apart. The bread and the fish, he busts them into pieces. Now, they were small fish to start with. Now, I personally, I like, so I'll ask a question for you. How many of you here like sardines? Okay, I, I like them. They're good. Or how many of you have ever gone to the restaurant and ordered smelt, which is a freshwater sardine, <laughs> basically. It's a little fish, you know. Uh, I used to go up to uh, Mile, Michigan, and they had the, sm the smelt run when they're, they're spawning. And they dip this big net in the ground, and five million s smelt. And you scrape, scrape, slit. Fry. Oh, they're like eating fish french fries. They're good. <laughs> I like that stuff. Okay? But they're small. Okay, you know, how many know what a sardine is? Get on the floor. I'm going to take a sardine sized fish, a smelt, and I'm going to break it into pieces. Okay, this is like, it's bite sized to start with. But he breaks them in pieces and he puts them in baskets. We're never told where the baskets came from. I think that's interesting. He's with the disciples. He's walked three or four days up to Galilee. He's up here. He sees a bunch of people coming. There's a kid with a couple of fish and a couple of, of, of biscuits. And he starts breaking them apart after he gave thanks. And he's putting them in baskets. Where did the big baskets come? Does God make sure that all the needs are met? Yeah. Even the ones we weren't really thinking about. We're thinking, I know, you're all thinking about, well, he's going to give these people the fish. And he's going to give them the bread. We know what he's going to do. Where did the baskets come from? <laughs> they were there. All right. He breaks them. He gives the baskets to the disciples. 
He says, now go feed them. So 12 guys are now serving 5,000 men. Let's just leave it at 5,000 men. Each disciple gets how many? What's 5,000 divided by 12? Come on, somebody with math. A bunch. Okay? If there were 10 disciples, 5,000 would break down into? Okay, so John, our mathematician. Each disciple gets Floyd. How many? 5,000 divided by 12. It should be like 475, 480. Yeah, by 12. About, about 480, something like that, right? Okay, 417 guys. Each disciple's got to feed 417 guys. One group of 417 is a lot. Wouldn't you think? Any of you, you're going to go and feed, serve 417 people breakfast, lunch, dinner, take your pick. That's a lot of people for one per. You go to a restaurant, you say the wait waitress is busy, she's got 417 and she's by herself. I'm trying to get you to think about this. Okay. So they're passing out the fish and they're passing out the baskets of bread and they're passing it all around. What part in this miracle do the disciples play? My lovely wife, what, what part do the, do the disciples play in this? They're servers. Pardon? They got to see the behind the scenes. They knew where it was coming from. Yeah, they, they know where it's coming from. They're, they're behind the scenes. The, peop, the people all sit down. People, don't, we don't know that they're all aware of this. I mean, if you're the last guy in the crowd and you're sitting in group, you know, 82, <laughs> here come the disciples with the stuff. Think how many baskets full of bread and fish pieces had their need to be okay so he gives each disciple a basket of fish and a basket of bread and says go feed 417 people i'm just trying to get us to think there's several possible answers as the people are taking the fish and the bread out that just never gets empty yeah like the like the little cruise of oil, or it could have been here so now i'm walking down there and i've got four or five baskets of each. I'm passing around, I'm going to go get more. I, I don't know how that worked out, but the supply never stopped. But what's the disciples' part in all of this? Fill up, feed them. We don't have enough money. Well, Lord, I got this kid here, but it's not enough. But then what did they start to do? What would they end up doing? Feeding them. Is God's will going to get done with or without you anyway? God is simply saying, do you want to participate in this? I'm going to do something miraculous. Stand still and see what I'm going to do. Would you like to be part of it? Oh, I just don't know. Stop looking at it through your eyes. What part in God's plan do you think you have? Well, I need to be like the Apostle Paul, and evangelize all of the Roman world? Or might you be the guy with a donkey at the crossroad, or the kid with a basket of fish and, bri and biscuits? Might you be the woman at the well? Hey, listen, the woman at the well, because of her, the whole city got saved. Who are you? Are you Jael, who drives the nail? Your sister is head? Who are you? We all like to think that somewhere along the line, God is actually going to grab a hold of me and put me into the spotlight. Humble yourselves, therefore. He will lift you up at the right time. Look at me. Please get this. Get this. I'm going to speak in a collective way, and you can argue about it later. If God is going to recognize you and lift you up to something great, where, what would be the best time that would ever happen in your life? At the Bema. Well done! Enter in! 
Well, you don't understand. I, I, I wanted to be the pastor of a church of 5,000 people. Really? You'd do that instead of hearing well done? Well, I, you know, I thought I would. It's not about you. It's not about me. If all God ever wanted you to do was have the donkey there at 2 o'clock or have the basket of fish there, did you get that done? What part in God's plan do you think you're supposed to have? Whatever he wants. How many... This, there's not an exact number, but how many people actually came out of Egypt in the, the Exodus? How many, how many names of people do you know? Most of them, you don't know who they are. And everybody who was 20 years of age or older that came out didn't go into the promised land. Okay, so this whole second generation, they're going into the promised land. How many of their names do you know? Well, I know Joshua and, and Caleb, they went in, and they, they, the Bible names a couple other guys. But most of the people involved in all that, we don't know their names. When David's mighty man, the Bible tells us who's about 30 of those many of mine are, but there, there was people out there that were fighting and winning wars and killing people and pulling down towers and doing great things and feeding their families and doing wonderful things. And there were priests that were doing stuff and, and serving sacrifices and... and thousands of people involved in biblical activities that are in the Bible and they're never mentioned in their name. So I know that when God finally wants to use me, he'll make sure that my name is in the headlines. Maybe your only job was to bring the sheep up and say, here, and then go home. That was all it was. There were shepherds out on a field one night, and the angels came, and the God's gonna, Jesus is going to be bear, born down there, and all that. We don't know any of their names. There were, there were some kings that came, and we've got traditionally Balthazar and Meltzar and all. We don't really know who they were. Is it important that people know who your name, what your name is? Or that you do something, oh, wow? Or maybe you just need to be there with a couple of biscuits and small fish when Jesus says to have them there. What part in God's plan do you think you're supposed to do? Whatever he wants. Whatever he wants. Pardon? Yeah, he can. And there are times in the, the, the question... If, if you're doing what you think you're supposed to do and then you get all proud about it, will God humble you? The Bible tells us of several examples where he just did just that. Listen, I'll use me as the illustration. I actually use the example for what it's worth. I'm, please don't take me wrong. God called me to be the pastor of this church. I don't know why. I'm not better than, smarter than, more spiritual than. I struggle every day. But this is the job he called me to do. I'm going to try to serve him as best as I know how and as best as he enables me. I have met pastors over my lifetime who thought they were all that in a bag of chips. And their people were there to control. Folks, you ain't my church, you're his church. It's a pri I'm just being open with you, honest with you. I don't have a type A dominant, gotta win personality. I'm, I don't have that. Many executives, leaders in business and in church, they have that. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you have to be careful about it. Just because you're in charge doesn't mean you're the boss. The Bible actually says, and do not be a lord over them. Folks, you stand before God and you answer for yourself. And God is not going to excuse or praise you because you did what I said. Or didn't do what I said. You do or don't do what God leads you to do. Now I can be very honest with you. The Bible says don't lie, cheat, murder, steal, pillage. All that. Don't do that. 
But should you come to the crossway? That's between you and God. Should you support the ministry? Yes, you should. Well, you need to give then exactly 10%. The Bible doesn't say that. How is God leading you? Should you sing in the choir? Should you teach a Sunday school class? Should you work in the nursery? Should you come and cut the grass? How is God leading you? Have you asked God what he wants you to do? If God never tells you to come cut the grass, then don't. But I'll tell you, the grass needs to be cut. You don't have to vacuum the floor. If God doesn't tell you to, don't. But have you, have you asked him? If he told you, were you listening? I'm not trying to get you on a guilt trip. I'm trying to think. Think about this. Has God been trying to get you to do something, and your attitude might be, well, God never talks to me. Because you won't do what he said the first time. I'm not going to have you drive down and get the groceries if I can't even get you to put your shoes off the, off the carpet. Take your shoes off when you come in the house. You won't do that. Why am I going to give you something else to do? Jesus said, I don't cast my pearls before swine. If you don't listen, I'm not going to keep talking. Well, he never answers my prayer. You ever listen to his answer? It's just a little challenge. That's part of, not part of the sermon. It's just a little challenge. Okay? All right. So verse 11. Now, on. Verse 12. And when they were filled... At least 5,000 men, there might have been more, but there was 5,000 guys. Now, how much are 5,000 guys going to eat? Because they're not just sat, they're full. When they were full, he says to his disciples, now go out and gather up the fragments that remain. We don't want to lose any of this. Was there more than they needed? Was there enough of God's blessings for everybody to get full of it? Was anything wasted? Now, we, we, we're never told what they did with the fragments. We're told we, they got them. But we don't know what they did with them. But they had them. There was more than they needed. And Jesus said, gather them up. We don't want to waste anything. So something then is done with them. But does God ever waste anything? Let me ask you something. Will he waste his time on you? If you aren't listening and won't do what he says, will he just say, have a good time and walk away and start talking with Fred? Yeah, he will. It's one thing to ignore God. It's a whole different thing when he ignores you. Now, what's he say? The day you call on me, I'll come back. How long do you have to talk to the wall before you figure you need to talk to somebody Well, I'm okay. I'm I'm, how long's that got to go before you go? Uh, I'm talking to myself. And nothing's getting done. And Jesus is going, as soon as you call, I'll come. But I'm not going to force myself into your life. You told me to get away, I'm standing over here. Listen, read your Bible. That's what the Bible says he does. He will not force himself on anyone. Well, he's not doing. If you ain't listening, he stops talking. All right. Nothing was wasted. Well, again, just to repeat, okay? Let's see. Terry, what's Philip's concern? Was it legitimate? Was money the issue? Okay. Jamie, Andrew there, was his worry legitimate? He was worried about how much stuff they had. No, it's not. Is money and stuff anything that God ever worries about? Oh, go! I gotta have gold. He invented it. Okay. Their 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 worries, their concerns were not legitimate concerns. So, what's your concern? Are your concerns legitimate, or will you just trust God and do what He says? You see, there's this lad here. And we're never told what happens to the lad. Other than he brought the fish and the biscuits. 5,000 people were taken care of. Stuff was left over. Philip and Andrew said, it's not money and stuff. Get your thinking straight. 
good enough lesson for today? All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your love for us. Help us now to understand your word, to read it and study it and understand what it says so we can be encouragements to others. We can grow in the Lord, and that we can be the kind of ambassador that we ought to be for you. For the name of Christ, I pray for his will I ask in our lives. Amen. All right. Floyd's going to have an offering plate back there with John. And if I can uh, get my music to play, I don't know if it's going to play or not because it might be on mute, but I don't think it is. But you can give money without music. We'll see what happens here. Now it's on mute, so don't worry about it. Think of a tune in your head. <laughs>